Hello everyone, so we've already talked about separable differential equations in the introduction to differential equations, but here I just want to do a few more examples. So let's recall just what makes, uh, so the idea for a separable differential equation essentially just means that you can write it in some kind of form like dy dx equals some function of x times some function of y, say some f of x times some g of y, and then the idea is you can separate by multiplication or division moving the x's to the right hand side of the equation and then the g of the y you could divide by g of y to move that to the left hand side of the equation and then you have integrals just in two separate variables x and y and you can just integrate both sides and uh, get your solution um, so let's go ahead and go through some examples so let's go ahead and just start with a uh, pretty straightforward one so this one will actually be an initial value problem so let's say um, we want to um, solve the IVP. So the, or again, the initial value problem is just a differential equation with a initial condition or a bootstrap condition. So you can actually solve for the constant uh, that, that you want to find. So uh, in this case, we have say y prime of x is equal to um, y squared times e to the minus x, and the initial condition is y of 0 is equal to 1 half. Okay, so we already see that the uh, differential equation is separable. It's written as a function of y, y squared times a function of x, e to the negative x. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to replace y prime with dy dx, and then write down my y squared e to the negative x. So what I want to do is I want to move my y to the left hand side and keep my x's on the right hand side. So basically I'm going to get 1 over y squared times dy and it's going to equal e to the minus x <coughs> times dx. And from this point I can just integrate both sides and I will be able to uh, solve the differential equation and in particular I'll be able to find that constant that we're looking for. So the antiderivative of uh, 1 over y squared is minus 1 over y. And then the e to the minus x is going to be minus e to the minus x. And then plus our constant. So um, you can solve for the constant now or you can go ahead and solve for y first. A lot of times what uh, you want to do is solve for y as a function of x because that's typically how we write our functions. So that's really not so hard to do. Um, we can start by multiplying both sides by the negative 1. So we get e to the minus x minus c. And then we can take reciprocals of both sides. So y is equal to 1 divided by e to the minus x minus c. And then we can plug in our initial condition, which was that y of 0 <coughs> is equal to 1 half. So basically 1 half will be what you get for y when you plug in 0 for x. So that's e to the negative 0, which is 0 minus c. Uh, well, that's just uh, e to the 0 is just 1. And again, we can take reciprocals on both sides to go ahead and solve for c. So we have uh, 2 is equal to 1 minus c. So basically, we're going to get negative 1 is our value for c. So. Uh, we can take this and plug it into this original equation up here to get our final answer. So combining these two, we see that y of x is equal to 1 over e to the negative 1, uh, negative x, and then we're subtracting c, which happens to be uh, negative 1, so that's going to become positive 1, or plus 1. So we get e to the 1 over e to the negative x uh, plus 1. And that's the solution to this initial value problem. So let's go ahead and look at another example. So in this last example, what we've done is we found an explicit equa uh, an explicit solution to the equation because we can actually solve for y. In some equations, it's not necessarily <clears throat> so easy to solve for y. So you may just leave it in the, the form where you first remove the derivative and, and establish the relationship between the variables. In this case, it would be this uh, line, negative 1 over y equals e to the minus x plus c and then solve for c so that's what's known as an implicit form because you can't uh, or 
you haven't explicitly solved for one of the variables. So sometimes, I mean, usually I'm fine with that. Um, it depends on, you know, in terms of what the question is, what form of solution they ask for. A lot of times people are just okay with an implicit solution. So let's go ahead and look at one where we're finding an implicit solution to an initial value problem. So this example we have, uh, so let's find the solution to the IVP, or let's say find an implicit solution. So again, that just means not necessary to solve for Y. Two, uh, so we're going to have the cosine of y times y prime of t, uh, and this will equal the sine squared of t times the cosine of t um, with y of 0 equal to pi over 6. So again, I always like to just replace uh, y prime with, in this case, it's going to be dy dt. So I, I would start by writing out cosine of y times dy dt. And that'll equal sine squared of t times the cosine of t. And then we just want to move the t over. Uh, so we have our y's to the left and our t's on the right hand side, so this will equal sine squared of t times the cosine of t dt. And now that we've separated variables, we can integrate both sides. Um, again, the right hand side is going to be a substitution. You're going to want to let u be uh, sine squared of t, and then uh, du will replace cosine of t dt. So on the left hand side, we just get the sine of y. And on the right-hand side, um, if u is sine squared and du is taking care of cosine, then basically we're going to get sine cubed over 3 or 1 third times sine cubed of t. Either way, I'm going to write it as sine cubed of t over t and then plus our constant. So at this point, we've essentially solved the differential equation. We just haven't sol solved for y. In general, if you're talking about taking an inverse trig function, it's really important to understand what interval you're doing it on. Uh, again, because, you know, uh, the sine function itself is not one-to-one, -one, so you have to specify a one-to-one -one region um, in order to understand how you're going to be applying the inverse. <clears throat> so that's why we want to leave this solution in implicit form rather than trying to solve specifically for y, because you can't really do it unless you want to know what, your, what, what principal region you're talking about. Okay, so, but we still can figure out what that constant is by plugging in 0 for t and pi over 6 for y. So we end up with the sine of pi over 6 equals the sine cubed of, uh, oh, 0. Oh, I made a, a typo. So above I wrote sine cubed of t over t. It should be sine cubed of t over 3 um, plus our constant. <clears throat> well, we know the sine of pi over 6 is, um, sorry, the sine of pi over 6 is just going to be uh, 1 half, and the sine of 0 is just 0, so we end up with just 1 half is the value of c. So our implicit uh, solution to this equation is just going to be the sine of y is equal to the sine cubed of t over 3 plus our 1 half. And that's the end of this problem. So let's do one more example before looking at uh, a word problem application that gives rise to the uh, logistic function. Um, so for this example, we are trying to solve, uh, again, another initial value problem. So solve the IVP uh, with Let's say we have y prime of 
x is equal to uh, the natural log cubed of x over x e to the y um, with y of 1 equal to 0. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, again, we're just separating the variables, so I'm going to replace y prime with dy dx. And I've got natural log cubed of x times x over divided by x times e to the y. So again, I'm going to move my e to the y to the right, and I'm going to get e to the y dy. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to get uh, just my natural log cubed of x over x dx. And then I want to integrate both sides. So the integral of the left is easy. Uh, the antiderivative of e to the y is just e to the y. And then on the right hand side, I need a u substitution. And again, if I let u be the natural log of x, du is going to take care of 1 over x dx. So I'm just going to be left with e to the y, and my antiderivative will be the natural log to the fourth of x over 4 um, plus a constant. So pretty straightforward. And then we just want to plug in our point to figure out that value for c. Um, and again, I'm just going to leave this as an implicit solution like we did for the previous problem. Um, you can go ahead and solve for y just by taking the natural log of everything. Um, so that's up to you. Uh, it's not too difficult to solve for y. So uh, y of 1 is equal to 0. So that means uh, y becomes 0 and x becomes 1. So we have the natural log to the fourth of 1 over 4 plus a constant. We know the natural log of 1 is just equal to 0. And e to the 0 is 1, so that tells us that c is equal to 1. So our solution here is just e to the y is equal to the natural log to the 4th of x over 4 plus 1. And that's our solution for this problem. Again, you can solve for y by just taking the natural log of both sides. So if you want to solve explicitly, you'd have the natural log of, uh, you'd have y is equal to the natural log of the quantity natural log of 4 to the x over 4 plus 1. Um, all right. Okay, this example, what we have is we have 50 fruit flies in some large jar. And basically what happens is they start to grow exponentially, but then eventually the food supply dwindles and they reach some sort of carrying capacity. That population has to stabilize. So that's modeled by the differential equation you see below, dp dt equals 0.1p times 1 minus p over 300. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and solve this IVP with that initial condition p of 0 equals 50, which is the initial population of the fruit flies. So this gives rise to uh, what's known as a logistic function that we'll see at the end, which is a really nice function that comes up in modeling all the time. So this is a nice example. It's given in the book also, but um, I wanted to go through it because the, the logistic function is a very important function if you haven't seen it before. So again, like with all the separable equations, what we want to do is we want to move the uh, p's to the left. And we don't have any t's, so it's just going to be 1 on the other side. So we get, um, or we can actually leave the point 0.1 on the right-hand side, if that maybe makes things a little more clear. So we'll have p times 1 minus p over 300 <clears throat> dp. And that will equal 0.1 times dt. And then we want to integrate both sides. So um, the right-hand side is just going to be pretty straightforward. It's going to be 0.1t plus some constant. Um, on the left-hand side, what we have to do is we have to do partial fractions. So I will leave it to you to check um, to do the partial fractions decomposition that um, basically 1 over p times 1 minus p over 300 is the same thing as 300 over p times 300 minus p. So that's pretty easy. You just multiply the top and the bottom by 300, 300 over 300. And that can be decomposed into 1 over p uh, plus 1 over 300 minus p. So basically, that's what we do here. Um, we write that integral as 1 over p plus 1 over 300 minus p dp. Uh, as we said, the right-hand side can just be written as 0.1t plus a constant. 
So this is just scratch work to check. And then that will, um, we can integrate those two separate uh, rational functions that we've decomposed it to. We're gonna get the natural log of the absolute value of P. Um, and then we're going to get minus, so there is a chain rule from the 300 minus P. The derivative of that is gonna be a negative one. So we're gonna have a minus natural log of 300 minus P. And this will equal that 0.1T plus our constant. So remember when you have natural logs and you're subtracting them, you can change those two uh, arguments into a quotient and write it as a single natural log. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that using the properties of the natural log. This is the absolute value of P over 300 minus P. And that is 0.1T plus our constant. And then what we wanna do is we want to just go ahead and uh, solve for p. Um, so solving for p is what gives rise to the uh, logistic equation. So basically we need to make both sides uh, exponents of e. So we end up with the absolute value of p over 300 minus p, and that will equal e to the point 0.1t plus c. Let's actually write that as e to the c times e to the point 0.1 t from properties of exponents. And uh, if we want to remove the absolute value, that basically means the other side has to be the positive value or the negative value. And we know the exponential quantity is always going to be positive. So we can actually just write this as plus or minus e to the c times e to the point 0.1t. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the absolute values and write it that way. So we're going to get plus or minus e to the c times e to the point one t. And um, since c is an arbitrary constant, we know that e to the uh, plus or minus e to the c is also an arbitrary constant. So we can use that trick again where we take the constant and then just replace it using that same letter again. So um, let's go ahead and do that. We can actually just write this as p over 300 minus p. And I'm just gonna call it plus or minus e to the c now, c again. So we get c e to the point one t. So that's uh, replacing plus or minus e to the c by c, since c is arbitrary. And then what we can do is we can go ahead and uh, we can solve for P. So let's go ahead and solve for P. Really what that's gonna to amount to is just cross multiplying and then factoring. So we'll get P is equal to 300 minus P times C E to the point one T. And basically we're gonna to wanna to move that term over here and then factor out the P. So we'll get P plus uh, P times C times E to the point one T. And we'll just be left with the 300 C E to the point one T. So we can factor out P from the left hand side and then go ahead and divide by that quantity. So we'll just be left with P is equal to this um, three hundred C E to the point one T over one plus um, C E to the point one T. Okay, so from here, there's some more funky simplification that's just used to kind of make everything prettier. So uh, one thing that's done is basically both the top and the bottom are multiplied by one over C. So if you multiply the top and the bottom by one over C, we get rid of that C on top. So we just get 300 E to the point one t over one over c plus e to the point one t okay and then what's done is since c is an arbitrary constant so is one over c so they go ahead and replace the one over c by c so we get c plus e to the point one t but then it looks a little clunky to have the exponentials in the same place. So what they do then is they multiply by e to the negative point one t over e to the negative point one t. 
And what that has the effect of doing is e to the point 0.1 times e to the negative point 0.1 is just going to come out to e to the 0, which is 1. So this is just written as 300. And then we uh, distribute the e to the negative point 0.1 on the bottom. And e to the negative point 0.1t times e to the point 0.1t just comes out to 1. And then we still have our c now times e to the negative point 0.1t. So this is the logistic function that is actually the general solution to this equation. Um, so in this particular case, we know that if you plug um, zero in, we started out with 50 fruit flies. So we can go ahead and solve for um, the value of C if we want. So we know that 50 is equal to 300 um, over one plus C times this E to the zero, which is just gonna be one. So we end up with 50 plus 50C equals 300. So we get 50C equals 250. And dividing by 50, we see that C is actually just equal to 5. So our specific solution to this initial value problem is 300 over 1 plus 5 times uh, e to the negative 0.1t. So that's it for this problem. But in general, this uh, logistic function is really nice. And uh, the, the general graph of it, I want to alert you to. So anytime you have a, a logistic equation that, say, looks like P of T equals some L over 1 plus a constant times E to, say, some uh, negative KX or negative KT, uh, the, the, the graph looks something like this. So... It has zero as an asymptote, as a horizontal asymptote on one side, and then the other asymptote is actually L. So this L is known as the carrying capacity. And what happens is your curve basically looks like this, and it has that exponential growth part, and then it flattens out and reaches the carrying capacity due to limitations based on resources. So in general, this is the graph of the logistic function. And that... Uh, parameter L is known as the carrying capacity. So you can go to like desmos.com and, you know, kind of toy around with the parameters if you want. But anytime you have some sort of like um, model where you see it uh, behaving exponentially, but then is eventually curbed due to the limitations of the environment, that's a nice signal that the logistic function might be a good curve to model that problem by. Anyway, this is Dr. Lennon signing off.